Chapter 8 of Quest of the Golden Ape by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Quest of the Golden Ape. Chapter 7 The Brown Virgin. Bram Forrest moved from unconscious into a dark half world of pain and frustration. He felt his flame seared body to be hanging upon the edge of a black abyss into which he could neither fall nor draw away from. At times, it seemed, gentle hands reached out to explore, but were without the strength to draw him back from the perilous precipice upon which he hung. There was an endless time of balance in this dark half-world, and then the thick blackness faded to a gray. The precipice seemed to draw away of its own volition, and the pain within him lessened. He opened his eyes. He was lying on a bed of soft, cool moss in a semi-dark cavern, with the sound of tinkling water in the distance. He lay staring at the ceiling for a long time, wondering into what manner of place he had come and how. Then his keen ears caught the sound of breathing other than his own, a soft breathing that fell gently upon his senses and calmed rather than alerted him. He turned his head and saw a beautiful, naked, brown-skinned girl kneeling nearby, but beyond his reach. He was struck first by the beauty of her face and form, and then by the fact that she was not as completely brown as his first impression had given him to believe. Her breasts and loins were of pure white, and droplets of shining water ran down her body. She was in the act of replacing a sort of leather harness upon her person, and Bram Forrest realized she had just returned from bathing at whatever place the unseen water gurgled, and laughed, and that she was now dressing herself. He held his peace until the act was completed, not wishing to embarrass her by making his consciousness known while she was nude. After a few moments, The harness was in place, and she rose to stand erect and shake out her dark, shining hair. Bram Forrest chose this time to speak. "'I do not know who you are, but I am obviously in your debt. My gratitude.' The girl reacted like a startled fawn and drew back several paces. "'You have regained consciousness?' "'It seems so. Where is this place, and how came I here?' We brought you. Bram Forrest's brow furrowed in thought. Oh, yes, now I remember. There were a group of people such as you at the place I tried to fight the dark swordsman with his own weapons. Bram Forrest chuckled ruefully. It seems I did not fare so well. When we discovered you were not our god, the others wanted to leave you there to die— but I resisted this as being inhuman and made them bring you here. Where are the rest? They have returned. Returned whence? The girl lowered her beautiful head sadly. That I cannot tell you. Bram Forrest smiled. Be not so sad. The fact that you prefer to keep the information to yourself is no reason for near tears. I am not sad for that reason, sire then why? Because you ask the question, and are even more surely, therefore, not our God. Bram Forrest was deeply curious and half amused at the trend of this conversation. Tell me this, then. Why does my asking the question eliminate all possibility of my being your God? Because if you were the God we seek and yearn for, you would not have to ask where my people went. You would know." Instead of clarifying the situation, Bram Forrest mused, each question sends me deeper and deeper into a mental labyrinth. We risked our lives in going to the place you found us. It was forbidden to credit the ancient legend of our people. Therefore, what legend? That upon this day and at that place our God would appear to deliver us. Bram Forrest now desperately seeking a question that would clarify rather than further befuddle, held up his hand. Wait, if you expected a god to appear and I arrived on schedule, how can you be so sure that I am not he? 
We thought so when you advanced upon the hideous Abarian and took his throat in your great hands. But when you not only allowed him to live, but also suffered him to take up his whipsword and come within an eyelash of killing you, we knew you were not our god. Bram Forrest nodded with understanding. I can see now how stupid that act was. Certainly not a manner in which a genuine god would conduct himself. He glanced at the girl and smiled. Please come closer, that I may see you better. She moved her head in the negative, reluctantly, Bram Forrest thought, and replied, If you were our god, I would gladly place myself in your power to do with me as you would. But as you are mortal, I must remain away from you. Bram Forrest frowned. Again, things get murky. I am a virgin, the beautiful girl explained simply and with no self-consciousness whatever. I must remain so until my time is ordained. If I lost my virginity, even through violation that I resist, I would immediately be delivered into the golden ape. Bram Forrest came upright, causing the girl to retreat a step further in alarm. The golden ape, did you say? Yes. And you are a virgin. This last was a statement rather than a question as Bram Forrest sank back, his eyes misty with thought. An ape a bore a stallion, he pondered. A virgin's feast. The girl eyed him with concern. Are you sure that your wound has not caused? It is not that, he said, switching his mind back to things of the moment. I was just wondering. Might you tell me your name without breaking any rules of reticence? I am Ilya, she said with a childlike solemnity that touched Bram Forrest. And does Ilya never smile? It seemed to him she made an effort to do this, but was so unfamiliar with the expression that she could not manage it. He extended a hand, not disconcerted that she did not come close and take it. He said, Ilya, I would not again ask a question you did not wish to answer before, but I am mightily puzzled about the life you must have led, about the manner of males you have had contact with, they are certainly a miserable lot if a female of their race must look to her virtue every waking moment. As for me, Ilya, and please believe, I would no more touch you in desire than I would knowingly injure a child. You are safe in my presence as in the most guarded room of a nunnery. If he expected gratitude or a pat on the back for his nobility, he was rudely surprised. Ilya straightened, her young breasts protruding gracefully and if she did not react with anger, her face mirrored something close to it. Then I am not desirable? Bram Forrest blinked. I did not say that. You are one of the fairest I have ever set eyes upon. This puzzled Ilya completely. Then in the name of the golden ape, why? Bram Forrest raised his hand with a gesture of both interruption and surrender. Please... Let us pursue this subject no further. The waters grow deep, and I suspect quicksand at their bottom. There are questions in my mind. Allow me to bring them forth with the understanding that you do not have to answer any you do not wish to. It was evident that Ilya's mind was also a bag of conundrums relative to this late candidate for godhood, who had insulted her desirability and yet complimented her upon it at the same time. She moved forward and sat gracefully down near the moss resting place of her patient. Bram Forrest was aware of her tenseness. She was like a beautiful animal, ready to spring away at the first sign of hostile movement on his part. But he also got the impression that coming within reach of his arms thrilled her. He believed this even while knowing that she would have fought like a tigress against any advance upon his part. He said, Ilya, you are indeed a strange child. You remained here after your people left and brought me back from the brink of death, even with the fear that I would rise up and violate you as soon as I acquired the strength to do so. Your thought processes are difficult to understand. Ilya lowered her eyes. 
You wish to ask some questions, sire? My name is Bram Forrest. The sire ill becomes you. Bram Forrest, she murmured experimentally. Then she raised her eyes, and there dawned upon her face the most brilliant of smiles. Her look was one of both dignity and gratitude. You do me much honor, Bram Forrest. Honor? I fail to understand. Ilya's eyes glowed proudly. Why, you treat me with such respect that I could be even Volna herself. And who is this Volna? Ilya was startled at this strange man's ignorance. Why, everyone on Tarth knows of Volna, princess of Nadia, sister of Bontark, who is prince of Nadia and ruler of that great nation. She is the most exquisitely beautiful woman ever to be born on Tarth. Fancy that, Bram Forrest said with a lack of enthusiasm that proved marked disinterest. I'm afraid I've never had the pleasure of the lady's acquaintance, nor of her illustrious brother either. Ilya lowered her eyes in sadness. She was also the sister of Jlomek. And who, pray, is Jlomek? I thought you knew, since you tried to avenge his death. He was the Nadian the cruel Iberian Retox slew under your very eyes. I'm sorry to hear that, Bram Forrest said. But the cowardly death had been accomplished, and Bram Forrest's mind did not dwell upon it, as he could not see where it affected him one way or another. Ilya, he said, take it as a supposition that I was born this very moment and know nothing of this world or its customs. With that in mind... Tell me of it, the things you would tell a wandering child. She glanced at him strangely. I will tell you all that I am not bound to hold secret. I would not wish to know more. The beautiful Ilya leaned forward, so preoccupied with the task she had set herself that all her reserve and wariness left her. Her action brought her lowered head close to Bram Forrest's face, and the sweet smell of her newly washed and shining hair was in his nostrils. Then he also became preoccupied with the map Ilya was drawing on the floor of the cavern. Long they sat thus, Ilya enjoying her task, and Bram Forrest's facile mind drawing in each syllable she spoke and committing it to memory. Finally the sun lowered and the interior of the cavern darkened until they could no longer see each other. The most important conviction Bram Forrest arrived at from Ilya's discourse was indeed a startling one. He was certain that this Tarth was a twin planet to Earth, of which there was complete knowledge in his mind. He could hardly escape the fact that Tarth swung in an orbit exactly opposite to that of its more familiar counterpart, thus remaining invisible from it. This conviction came to him through several things Ilya said and it was buttressed by a bit of Tarthan mythology she chanced to mention. The legend told of a flame god, obviously the sun, which stood forth in its wrath one long-distant day, and hurled two great stones at a demon who came from far away bent upon torment. This last, Bram Forrest thought, was perhaps a comet of great size that tore both worlds from the sun and set them upon their orbits. The existence of the mythological legend indicated, too, that civilization on Tarth was not backward, or at least had not been in ages gone. In the more exact realm, Bram Forrest learned that Tarth was far less watery than its invisible sister, scarcely half its surface consisting of ocean. It had two ice caps at the poles, known as the Outer Reaches, and an equator termed the Inner Belt. There were no isolated continents, according to Ilya's map, all the dry surfaces being connected by wide passages of land through the continuous ocean. Ilya's description of the people interested Bram Forrest most intensely. On Tarth, he learned, there was no association of nations, each mistrusting the others in a world where a state of continuous war at some point of the globe was an accepted state of affairs, which no one sought to ameliorate. Ilya herself was hazy upon the description and number of the nations. 
she thought some two hundred existed, but only the most important could she describe. The Abarians were the most successfully warlike, fearing only the Nadians to the south. This was because, though the Nadians were not aggressive, and even treated other lesser nations in a kindly fashion, they possessed an inherent fighting skill and a power potential that had not been tested in recallable history. Though they had not fought for centuries, their potential had not lessened, because such a folly would have been considered tantamount to national suicide on Tarth. There were also the Utalians, that Bram Forrest visualized as some sort of lizard-men, for the reason that they possessed the defensive characteristics of the chameleon. There was also another intriguing race, no member of which Ilya had ever seen. She referred to them as the Twin People of Coombe, an area near the north outer reach. Bram Forrest speculated upon what manner of people they would be and it came to him that the evolutionary processes on Tarth had not corresponded to those of Earth, where all members of the human race evolved into practically the same form. Then a name came into Bram Forrest's mind, a name that rose out of that mysterious well of knowledge in his subconscious, a well he could not explain, but had been forced to accept. He no longer questioned it. Tell me of the Ophridians. Ilya started as though he had slapped her. The deep brown of her beautiful face paled somewhat, and her eyes grew very sad. Bram Forrest saw the sadness by the light of the moon that had risen and was sending wan light in through the cavern's entrance. He only sensed the paleness from the tremor of Ilya's voice. It grows late. I must go and bring food. Your strength must be nurtured and greatened. With that, she hurried off in the direction of the sounding water, leaving Bram Forrest both bewildered and intrigued. Why had she reacted so violently to his question? And for that matter, why had he been able to ask the question in the first place? By what process did he know the name Ofrit, and that it designated a nation on Tarth? without knowing of that nation and already possessing the knowledge for which he had begged the patient and beautiful Ilya. Then he remembered that he had resolved not to wonder about these things, and at the same instant remembered something else. The small flat package that had fallen from the box back on earth. It had been his first thought upon regaining consciousness near the Ophridian well, but it had been pushed from his mind by subsequent events. How long ago had that been? He tried to assess the passage of time, but failed. The only indication of its length was the fact that he bore no wound where the Abarian's blade had entered his body. That pointed to a long span of unconsciousness, but perhaps there were contributing factors. He had sensed that the mysterious Ilya had at her command something that had healed him very swiftly, but he had no proof of this. At any rate, he had to retrieve the package if possible. But would it be possible? Granted the strange disk had brought him somehow from Earth to Tarth, would it repeat the process in the opposite direction? He resolved to find out and began unbuckling the disk from its place on his right wrist. As he did this, a sound manifested outside the cavern, but he was so intent upon his task that he gave little note. Quickly, he strapped the disc into its potent position on his left wrist. Then he sat tensely, awaiting the reaction. As he waited, the sound without became so pronounced he could no longer ignore it. He raised his head and saw a tall, sinister form outlined against the moonlight. He was unable to distinguish the features, but the outline told a sickening truth. Also, the drawn whipsword spoke eloquently of who this intruder was. The abarian of the Ophridian well in search of prey. The cowardly assassin who would now enter and find a defenseless man and a beautiful girl who would set him aflame with lust. Rage threw a red curtain over Bram Forrest's eyes as he struggled up to meet the intruder. But the latter never saw him. 
because at that moment the now familiar nausea seized Bram Forrest's vitals, doubling him over. And when the Iberian had advanced into the cavern, he found only an empty bed of moss, Bram Forrest having been snatched up and whirled into darkness by the relentless hand of time put into terrifying motion. End of chapter 8